you might know I studied in Ireland during the war or what they like to call the troubles. I was a theology major, a peace studies minor in college. So the Irish war zone seemed like the place to be. It was very intense and from time to time I was spiritually exhausted, often completely depleted of hope. After a particularly difficult week, our teacher put us in a van and drove us quite a long way to park. I know I, I told you once before about the time he took us to a mountain, this time he took us to a park. So we got out and he told us to just to explore and to rest that we had all day and it was really very nice. I left my friends behind and I just wandered around a while. I sat on a big rock, I wrote for a while, I got some ice cream and then I followed this path that seemed to wander through the woods, I mean, a good long time. But ultimately, this path opened up. And when it did, I was confronted with astounding beauty. I stopped. There wasn't any way to continue to move. I had been overtaken by a stillness of what was before me. The land was so silent. My stillness was the only appropriate response. The park was Glendalock, and what was before me was the majesty of two mountains and this clear, motionless lake that lay between them. I stood silently and completely still. And others came up behind me on the path and each one stopped as I did. I think our resistance to motion came from a profound respect for the lake and the mountains that stood still for millennia. We were demonstrating reverence to the gods of the mountains. It was a moment of veneration shared by strangers, all being healed by the gift of the lake between the mountains. Earth, teach me stillness. My time living in a war zone was particularly intense, but I've lived in other kinds of war zones. I suspect we've all had versions of war zones in our lives, places we need to get on the armor before entering, places we need to be armed and ready. Our planet can be a difficult place. I wrestle with this reality, wanting so much for things to be different. I have a friend who lives in what I call radical compassion. She commits her life to a world of gentleness. And I, I have her and I have some other friends who just dedicate their lives to limiting or eliminating pain for all beings. I, I have a similar instinct, but I, also think there's something real and necessary in our suffering. I mean, I fight to end it in a thousand ways, but I also challenge myself to confront it, to face into the reality of what life is on this very difficult planet. Many years ago, I was watching a documentary which has in fact informed my theology ever since. A, a polar bear, was with her cub. As the narrator was telling us, the cub was going to starve to death soon if she couldn't find him food. This lucky mama tracked a seal family hiding beneath the ice. Another mama and her babies, the polar bear slamming on the ice over and over as the frightened seal hid her cubs beneath her own trembling body. The polar bear couldn't get through. She continued to walk in the snow with her baby beside her, doing everything she could to find him something to eat. And in my mind, she did. 
but really there it is. Right? Someone will die. The seal or the bear. Someone's baby isn't going to make it. That's our reality. Earth, teach me suffering. Earth, teach me caring. In the face of that, my concerns can seem small. I worry about all kinds of things, but I'm not worried that my baby will starve to death. Humility, by definition, means knowing our place in the world, our, our real place, not the place of social constructs. Standing before the mountains at Glendalough or confronting the reality of suffering on this planet, I am humbled. I know my place here. Earth, teach me humility as the blossoms are humble with beginnings. I don't live in the city. I do hope to have an apartment there one day, but for now I live in Westchester at the very top of the county in a town with a semi-rural designation. I have a lot of wooded property around my house, but it's actually very difficult to grow things like flowers or vegetables. The soil isn't great and there are a lot of deer. So very few plants get a real shot. But it doesn't mean that I don't try. The last spring, I became completely committed to two dozen tulips I planted in front of my house. It's been years since I planted them, but I have never seen a single bloom till last year. So it's an annual tradition for a mob of deer to demolish them right as they begin to bud. They come up and you can see, and then gone. One, one morning I come out and the mob has cleared the way. So last year was different. I had this new strategy and it worked. Tulips began to show their heads, gently pushing through the soil, soaking up sun and rain, getting ready to open up and let us bask in all their glory. Like every morning I checked on them. There was nothing I can do. I, I, I had some extra time, I admit, last March and April. I found a way to keep the deer from them but the rest was up to them. So I spent March and April in grateful anticipation as I watched them bloom. Earth, teach me humility. Earth, teach me limitation. Those flowers seemed more necessary last year than in the years before. And of course, I also did have some extra time. Doesn't really feel like spring ever happened though last year. It's more like the semi-hibernation that happens in winter has simply extended all the way through these 13 months. There's something wonderful about winter, about staying inside, speaking to fewer people, doing less, sleeping more. At this point, it's become a way of life. And it's not necessarily a way of life anyone wants to let go of. And, or at least some people are feeling like there's something healing about the quiet, the, the shrinking of social circles that were likely too large. But spring finds a way to bring us back outside, back into the world from which we'd retreated. Earth can't help but show off and warming the air, making days bright, dotting the streets with daffodils, enticing children back to playgrounds and adults to park benches as we all admire the birds who dance and sing and welcome the new season. No matter the grief, the fear, the loneliness, the sadness, even the joyful isolation, Earth calls us back again, showing us a world awake and alive beckoning us to share in her glory. Earth, teach me regeneration. Long cold winters can happen, happen at any time of year. Or sometimes 
for more than a calendar year, right? Seasons of death or illness or loss of financial security or mental health can make any July feel like January. Long nights worrying about how you can pay the bills or long days sitting bedside to someone you love or empty afternoons missing someone who's no longer sharing your days or nights can happen at any time of year. And the riot of blooming daffodils isn't gonna change that. Only time can heal those wounds. Time and courage. The willingness to stand your ground even as the wind blows around you, even as storms brew. Healing comes from living through those painful days, from waking up in the morning and facing yet another difficult day, from going to bed, even on nights you know there'll be no sleep. Recovery is available when we weave time with great intentionality, when we risk honesty and vulnerability. Spiritual restoration can be taught by the trees. I used to live near a tree that had caught a bullet. The tree was shot. It happened maybe 50 years before I got there. The tree very slowly, really imperceptibly grew around the bullet. The, the tree stood its ground, remained rooted in earth and healed the broken places. The bullet remained. The tree remained. The tree continues to stand vulnerable to what's next. We can learn from the trees. We can learn the strength of vulnerability and the resilience needed to last a long time. There's power in knowing bad things happen, that loss is inevitable, that life is full of change, and the unknown is frightening, but it's not a permanent place. Earth, teach me resignation. Earth, teach me courage. These qualities are all necessary if we're gonna live well through the end of this pandemic. Even once this public health crisis passes, We'll have to confront the erosion of our democracy through voter suppression and the purchasing of lawmakers by big money and the gradual elimination of safety nets for the poor and the exponential increase of carbon in our atmosphere, altering Earth's ability to sustain human life. And really, that's just a few things. I didn't want to get too depressing with the list of stuff that's going to go on that is going on, ongoing and ongoing for centuries, for millennia. If we're gonna live well, we're gonna live successfully, live joyfully. If we're gonna be effective agents of change in these difficult days, we need to know stillness and resignation and courage and regeneration and limitation and suffering and caring and humility. We need to remember where our power comes from, where we can get what we need. I know in the onslaught of public chaos, I need stillness, I need silence. I need to walk in the woods and sit by the pond. I need to escape to places like Glendalock where I can be filled again. I also need the strength of people like you who understand the value of radical compassion, who want to be awake to your own suffering and healing, who know where the bullets have hit you and who have learned or are learning to grow around them people who know the chaos and complication of this difficult planet, who can connect authentically with each other and who have so many times brought your own vulnerabilities right to this church, making all of us stronger for it. Earth, teach me to remember. So often when trying to reconcile the evils of the world with the idea that there's a God in charge, one with all power who knows everything, who's just and merciful, the response is that God has given us free will, that if bad things are happening, it's on us. 
So I'm not going to get into the theological inconsistencies there today, but I do wonder about the responsibilities of that kind of freedom. Uh, just to be clear, that is not the God I believe in, but the free will thing seems fairly apparent to me. The birds seem so free as they fly above us, as they sing from their perches, as they leave for the winter and return in the summer. They do experience a different kind of freedom than we do with our earthbound bodies, but birds aren't anarchists. They fly looking for food and materials to build their nests where they can lay eggs and keep their babies safe. They fly to escape predators or to protect their own or to flee an oncoming storm. They experience necessity. They are free to ignore their own needs as are we, but most of what they do is because they have an instinct to survive. They also have an instinct to help each other survive. When geese are ready to travel, they find other geese also ready and they fly in a V pattern to make the trip easier on the group. The one at the front is the hardest job confronting the winds and navigating the travels. And they take turns, each leading the way for a time and each benefiting from the power of traveling together. If one goose is having trouble, she'll land and two others will follow and they stay with her until she's well enough to travel again or until she dies. They don't know her. They're just traveling companions, but they stay together in times of difficulty. Earth, teach me freedom. Earth, teach me kindness. People come to worship on Sunday, bringing their hunger and broken hearts, seeking replenishment and healing. I know that feeling, that need for deep rest. Today we're celebrating Earth Day. And in all that Earth can teach us, and Earth is everything around us and within us. It's the trees and the birds, the flowers, the rain, the air, it's our own bodies. It's also all the materials for the buildings we're sitting in, the screens we're looking at, the clothes we're wearing, the sidewalks outside, all of it. Everything is given as a gift from Earth. She brings us healing, offers us sustenance and rest and joy and home. We will only save her if we love her. To save her is to save ourselves and each other. We are each in need of the same love. So let's lean in, learn what earth is teaching and let ourselves be held in her generosity.